now that we have discussed pointers, we will discuss some issues related to parameter passing, which could not be clarified earlier. So far we have seen that parameters are passed by value, which means that actual parameter values are copied to the formal parameters. So I'm saying that we would like to discuss additional mechanisms of parameter passing, which are quite important in actual programming practice. We'll see how C++ allows that. We'll also discuss the facilities to provide for formatted output, which the C out statement is singularly unable to do. It does work in that it can produce output for all the variable names that we give or the array elements or arrays or strings, but we can't format the output the way we like. We cannot control, for example, how many decimal digits will be printed for a floating point number. There are two special functions called printf and scanf, which we'll be discussing in this context. We'll then look at some more string functions I'll only introduce string copy and string compare, but basically we'll be using sprintf and scanf to some extent. In the context of handling strings, which are given as input on the lines, or in the context of combining certain values, putting them together in an ASCII character form as if it is a formatted output, but not throwing it out to the terminal, but putting it inside a string ourselves. So we'll see these functions, and we will discuss the more general and important concept of files. You're all familiar with files. When you write your programs, you use gedit to create files. These are all text files. These are the files which are looked at by the compiler. Very often when you have to submit large amount of data values, you often create those data values as a part of text file and use the input redirection to read those values automatically from the file. So we know that files containing text data, lines of text, can actually be handled by the machine as if they are typed at the terminal. What we would like to do is, we would like to find out whether we, in our programs, can handle such files directly. The answer is yes. We shall be looking at sequential disk files today, but there are files which may contain information other than text information, encoded information, such that internal representation of binary numbers, floating point numbers, etc., could be stored on the disk as is in blocks, and you would be able to directly access those blocks, read them, retrieve them, update them, rewrite them. These are extremely powerful facilities. We will discuss the direct access files and the binary files later after the midsem, but today we'll introduce the notion of files. So very quickly to recap, the passing of parameters we have said, parameters are passed by value, which means if I have defined a function f, the function has two parameters x and y, and in this function, I am evaluating some value sum is equal to five into x plus y, uh, uh, modulo 10, some arbitrary uh, calculation. And I will return one value whose type is declared as the type of the function. In actual program, I may write something like int abc. For example, when this program is executed, I have the value of a here, I have the value of b here, and I will have a location for c. When I read the values of A and B from input, some two arbitrary values will be given by you, which will go into the locations of A and B. Let's assume that these values are, let's say, 12 and 7. Now, at this juncture, when I invoke F A comma B as a part of an expression on the right-hand side, the control will go over to this function. Please note that when this function was compiled, effectively, locations for x were set up, location for y was set up, so you would have x, y, and you would have, of course, a location for sum, which was declared explicitly. 
Note that x and y are two formal parameters which are supposed to receive values from the function and sum is a local internal variable. So when you invoke this function and go over there, along with this will go the values of a and b. These are actually copied to the locations x becomes 12 and y becomes 7. So effectively this value goes here and this value goes here. The value is actually copied, that is our understanding. Eventually, when the calculations are done inside the function, phi time x is how much? 60, 12, 12 phi is a 60, yes. And y modulo 10 is still 7. So what will be sum? 67. Since I am saying return sum, and since the return value is integer, this value 67 will be returned as an integer. Where will it come back? into C? No. It will not come back into C. There is a small fine distinction that you have to make. A function returns to the point of invocation. The point of invocation is this function called FAB. So therefore, with this value, you will come back here. And this value 67 will actually replace the reference to the function. In short, F A comma B now becomes 67. It is incidental that on the left hand side we have C, to which this value 67 would be assigned. But there could well be an expression F A comma B plus 13.7 into something else, minus something else, in which case this will only replace one reference. Okay. And then finally whatever is the expression will be evaluated, the final value will be C which happens to be 67 in this case. Is that understood? This is the mechanism. So what are the possible problems with this? Actually, we don't see any problem as long as we have to carry out things of this kind only, where we have to send some actual parameters to formal parameters and then evaluate some value and return that value. The problem starts when we consider that if I have a large number of parameters, I will have to copy a large number of them. It's okay if they are simple parameters like int a, float b, car c, whatever, whatever, maybe 10, 15 parameters, but still there is an overhead. Those 10, 15 values will have to be copied to locations there and a return value will have to be brought back. What if a parameter is a large array? A thousand. So thousand elements will have to be copied. What if I am trying to do a matrix uh, uh, linear equation solution kind of thing and I want to send a 100 by 100 matrix, 10,000 elements will have to be copied. The overhead indeed would become very considerable. Additionally, and this is the more important part, while I am sending 10 parameters to the function, I am getting back only one value. There could be occasions when I may want more than one value back. Now since the return value by a function can only be one, I cannot return more than one value. The only alternative way is to have the value come back through the parameters which I have set. Which means that if some parameters are modified inside that function, that modification should reflect in the actual parameters back home. Unfortunately, that is not permitted by C+. But such could be a valid requirement. In particular, when I have arrays as parameters, forget the overhead of copying, consider this function, int sim solve, int n, float c 100 comma 100, float b 100, float x 100. Do you recall what these would be? Float c 100 comma 100 could be a coefficient matrix. Float b 100 could be a right hand side matrix. And float x 100 would eventually contain the values of the unknown 100 variables. Of course, I may not have a 100 by 100 equation set, so I will pass n as a parameter. So first of all, the overhead, even if n is 10, or 15, you are solving a set of 15 simultaneous equations. As far as the function is concerned, it has no clue that you are solving 15 by 15 equation. Okay, because it does not understand the semantics of what you are doing. It will take a 100 by 100 array C, copy it there, 100 array elements of B, copy it there, and 100 elements of X, which actually in the main program would have no value at that time. Some undefined value, it will copy. And eventually, it will stupidly return only one value, which is int. So whatever I do, I will get back only one value, which is not adequate. Indeed, in such a situation, this int 
is meaningless. Even if it returns some value, what will I do with it? It is of no consequence to me. Actually, I want many more values. N values of unknown variables is what I want. But we note here that even in such situations where this int may not of any, be of any consequence, I may still use it effectively for a different purpose. I may, for example, return a value 0 to indicate that problem was solved properly. I may return a value minus 1 to indicate that the value was not solved properly. Or I may choose not to return any value. I would then like to have a provision in C++ function definition which will explicitly tell C++ compiler that this function will not return any value. However, the larger problem is still to be answered. How do I get my x100 back? Here is another case. Function to swap values in locations A and B. Here is a main program, x, y, x is equal to 5, y is equal to 10. How do I swap values normally? I will have x here, which is 5. I will have y here, which is 10. So ordinarily, what will I do? I will announce a temporary variable temp. I will say temp equal to x x equal to y, y equal to temp. Suppose I decide to write a function, swap function. So I, what I will do? I will say swap x, y. That means please go to the swap function. We take the values x, y. Now I want x and y to be swapped. I am really not interested in what the function returns as a function value. That is why on the left hand side I have said dummy equal to this. I don't care what that value is. But look at what will happen inside the function. When I go to this function, I have a location A for formal parameter, I have another location B for another formal parameter, and I have a temp here. As we understand the function invocation, the value of x will be copied to A. So, 5 will come here. The value of y will be copied to B. So, 10 will come here. Very good. Let us look at what the function does. The function says, in temp, temp equal to a, a equal to b, b equal to temp. So you understand what this will do now? It will actually swap the values of a and b. So a will first come to temp. Then a will get the value 10 here. Uh, sorry, this will become 10. And then this will become 5. So far, so good. A and B have been swapped. But when I come back with this return 0, where will I come back? I will come back here. What will be the value of swap as a function? 0, because I am returning 0. And that will get assigned to dummy, that is 5. But does anything happen to X and Y here? No. Because A and B remain where they are. They remain swapped, but I don't get any reflection. This is nonsense. So this cannot be accepted. Unfortunately, in C++, the only permissible mechanism is to transfer parameters by value. So we have to look for something else. C++ fortunately provides this mechanism by using a facility called passing by reference. What does passing by reference mean? Instead of passing an actual value, suppose I pass a pointer. So instead of passing x, I pass the address of x. Instead of passing y, I pass the address of y. Obviously, when I pass addresses, they can't be held in normal variables in the function. So the corresponding formal parameters must also be pointer parameters. Now, inside that function, if I operate upon contents of those addresses, since those addresses refer to my memory locations here, operations will take place on my memory locations. When the function returns, whatever dummy value I get, the pointer values which I have sent will not come back. But because those pointers have facilitated operations on my actual values, I will effectively get my parameters changed. That is exactly what is done here. So there is no copying of arrays. You just pass parameters. Of course there is copying, but there is no copying of values. There is copying of pointer values. Here is passing by reference. 
So what am I doing here? Int main. Int x equal to 5, y equal to 10. This is x is 5. This is y which is 10. Notice that when I call swap now, I am saying and x and y. What does and x do? Address of x. Let us say the address of x is 10,000. Let's assume that x and y were given consecutive locations. It doesn't matter whatever be the address of y, but let's assume this was 10,004. So these are the addresses. Please note that this swap call, what it will take to the function will be these addresses 10,000 and 10,004, not the values. Obviously, these addresses cannot go and reside in integer or floating point locations. They have to reside in a pointer location. We will see how that function could be written. Notice that I am not expecting any value to come back from swap. That is why I have not said something equal to swap plus something. I have simply said swap. I don't care that swap to return me any value. But I want x and y to be exchanged. Let us look at what happens inside the function. Int star a, int star b. Now look at these locations. This is the location for star a. This is the location for b. Actually not star a, it's the location for a, location for b. But a is a pointer. b is a pointer. It is int star. When I say swap and x and y, and x means pointer to x, will come and sit in a, which is what value? 10,000. What was the value of pointer to b? 10,004. I mean pointer to y. These pointers have come here. Now look at the actual internal handling. Int temp. So this is a temp location. The actual statement says temp equal to star a. What does that mean? Assign to temp a value which is pointed to by the contents of a. Because a is a pointer. So actually at this time a reference would be made to the location 10,000. Please remember the entire memory is uniformly available to my program which has been allocated. So I will actually go to 10,000 which is location for x. So I will be collecting x, putting it in temp. Then collecting y, star b is y, putting it in x because star a is x. And then putting the temp into star b which is y. So obviously nothing will change in a and b. But effectively x and y will get swapped in the original. Form. Notice that in order to emphasize that I don't intend to return any specific value calculated by the function as such, I write this function as void swap. Void is a C++ keyword which says this particular function will not return anything. Void. Null. Nothing. So therefore it will be wrong to say something equal to this function. In fact, this function will always be invoked as a standalone statement. It will just do whatever it wants to do. Can you see how powerful the system is? Please note that C++ is not violating the fundamental principle. The only mechanism available is still passing by value. But we're sort of cheating that. We're saying we'll pass the value, but not an actual value, but a pointer to that value. And then whenever you operate, you come back and operate actually on my real parameters. Now, this is another thing which we never mentioned explicitly, but this is what happens automatically. Whenever you name an array as a formal parameter and as an actual parameter you pass another array, arrays are never copied. The pointer to the base element of the array is always transferred as a pointer which is retained inside the formal parameter. Please remember array locations are always allocated contiguous space as we know. Given the pointer, the function will be very well able to calculate which location it means even if I manipulate an array A, I, J. If it knows the address of A0, it can find out where A, I, J or where A, K is. So therefore, when you pass arrays, fortunately there is no overhead of passing any large chunk of values by copying them, only a pointer will. What it also means is therefore, 
anything that you do to the arrays in the function, you are actually doing it to the original arrays. So obviously, if some changes happen there, those changes will happen here also. Is, is this clear? So this is how the parameter passing through reference works. Yes, what he is suggesting is a cute way of solving the swapping problem. He says, if I want to swap two values x and y, I'll put x in the zeroth element of an array, y in the first element of an array, pass the array, change a0 and a1, and come back. And then I will assign the zeroth element to y and first element to x. It, it is a moot point as to which involves more Godagiri. Putting x into zeroth element, y into first element, then going there, then again putting this element here. And x and y would perhaps be simpler. But it is definitely a clever solution. Whenever you have large number of values which you want to modify, put them in an array, array will automatically. Do. However, knowing that pointer passing mechanism is what is facilitating this, you might do well to pass arrays as arrays, because they will go as pointers, and you pass other parameters as pointers, and deal with the pointers. So that is relatively. In fact, that is the standard way people write programs. It is now in this context of pointers that we have understood and the function calls, we will see for some additional functions for input output. As we know, C++ does not have any internal instructions for performing input output. There is no input output instruction. C in and C out, which you have been using, as we shall see later after the mid when we study objects and classes and the operators and so on, C in and C out are called spatial streams. And greater, greater, less, less are the extraction operators. So they work, C in, for example, works on input which is typed as a string on your terminal. It takes the string and extracts one value, then again greater, greater, another value, greater, greater, another value, etc. It has its own rules. It will ignore blanks on either side. It will go beyond the new line character, etc. And of course, it must find correct input for floating point, fixed point, etc., so that there is no problem. Now, one of the biggest issues with that is that if I have to write my name, say Deepak Blank Fatak, and read this as a single string, there is no way I can do that with C in. Because the moment first blank occurs, C in believes that the uh, string has terminated. So, there is similarly, when I output using C out, I say C out x, where x is equal to 7.348215, or where x is equal to 0.00000156 something. We have no control on how that x will be printed. It will be printed in an intelligent fashion, but depending upon the whims and fancies of C out. We would like a greater control on what we print and how it looks, and we would also like a greater control on what ASCII characters we read and how we interpret them ourselves. For that, there are functions called scanf and printf. So these are the two functions which perform formatted input and output. The way these functions are written is, there is a format string which is written as the first parameter of printf. This is followed by large number of values or variables whose values are to be output. What C++ does it, it takes that format string and applies specific format specifiers to those variables. What that string is, what are the format specifiers, let us look at some example to understand this. Here is an example, printf percent %d is a number backslash n capital. Obviously, capital N is some int value declared. Let us say N has a value 523. Now, when I execute this print statement, what happens is C++ starts looking at what is to be printed. There is only one variable N. There could have been N, M, P, whatever, but there is one here. Now, it looks at this format string. This percent %d, in fact, anything starting with a percent is a format specifier. So, whenever it sees percent %d, it says, ah, this is telling me how to print the first value. There could be percent %d, another percent %d, percent %g, we shall see what other parameter, other format specifiers are. One each will be used to be associated with one of the variables. 
the remaining string will be printed verbatim as it is. Just like you say, see out, hello, how are you? Or give me value of n, whatever you print, including backslash n. In fact, you can have a print statement. They are perfectly valid print statement. There is a format string, no variable to be put. That is why there is no specifier here. In such case, the printf function will simply produce the ASCII characters contained in that string. This is typically the first program that one writes in C, C++, the greeting program, all over. However, if you want to print some text, but also print some values by converting the internal form of those values like binary, floating point, etc., into ASCII characters, then that is where the format specifiers come. For example, this percent %d actually corresponds to the conversion of an integer number into corresponding ASCII character. Remember, this 523 internally will be a binary number, a 4 byte number. But I would like it to be seen as 523. That is how I read it. Symbol 5, symbol 2, symbol 3. So this is what this particular percent %d will do. These are additional format specifiers. Apart from saying percent %d, you can also say percent %6d, for example. This number that you write before the character d is called the field width. It specifically says that whatever value you print, it has to occupy six spaces. So look at how you can specify exactly how your output will look like. Suppose I print a value which is 523, then this 523 being a numerical value will be right justified in that field. So I will have blank, 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 523. That is exactly how you would like numbers in a table, for example. So they would look decent. Notice that in C out, you have no such control. A four-digit number will come as a four-digit number, three-digit number will come as a three-digit number. Here, you can control it. Percent %7s will print a string. So if you have an array, char, name, 60, of course, in that element, uh, 60 uh, element array, you don't expect to have a larger string, otherwise you would have used a a larger width than 7. What this means is, first 7 characters of that string in the array will be printed. And that will occupy 7 space. Suppose a string has less characters. Suppose a string has only 3 characters. How? H-O-W. In the space of 7 uh, uh, bytes or 7 ASCII cores, where will this how come? H-O-W? Leftmost, rightmost. Well, that's, that's the problem. Numerical values are aligned rightmost. Strings are always aligned leftmost. So if there are only three characters, H, O, W will be output, and three blanks will be output to fill up the remaining space. So blanks are padded for shorter string on output. Percent 8.2F will print a floating point value. Sorry, if you have a longer string, it will be truncated beyond 7. Remember, it is the compiler which is looking at all your program. If your program, whenever you have a printf statement, it is the compiler's responsibility to analyze the format string that you have given, to identify all the format specifiers. Suppose you have four format specifiers, and it does not find four matching values, it will say wrong statement. It's a syntax error. This 8.2f will actually allocate eight spaces to print a value. So suppose you had a value, let's say 73.421. Let's say I had float x, and somewhere I had said if I say print f, percent 8.2 f x. It is clear that x will be printed in 8 spaces, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. The first number is the total width. No matter what happens, this width will not be exceeded. 8.2 means there have to be 2 digits after decimal point. Since there are 3 decimal digits after this here, the last one will go off. I will have here 2. I will have here 4, then I will have a decimal point, I will have 3, and I will have 7. The first 3 will be black. 
So that is how it will format it. You have to be, of course, careful that you provide enough space for minus sign, etc., etc. Unfortunately, the numbers are very funny, like 0 0.000015. That's a valid number. And you are interested in knowing whether it is 15 or 17 at the end. But if you print it in this format, you will get 0, 0.00. So you use a format called G here. A, a G format automatically converts the value into exponential notation. So this 8.2G means if I have a value like 0 0.00015, it will actually print it as 0.15E minus something, so that you are, the value is visible. There are n number of other details. Any book on C, C++ programming will give you the meaning of the format specifiers and what exactly they do for printf statement. A scanf does exactly the opposite. A scanf also has a format specifier string, but there is no output that is to be generated out of that format specifier. Instead, some input is being given by you when you type your input. The format specifier for scanf tells you how the input is to be interpreted. The input is to be interpreted as per the format specification that you do. Those ASCII characters which come from the keyboard, say you write 734, which is supposed to be a value 734. So these ASCII characters are supposed to be converted. You can use percent %d for example again. So 734 will come. 734 will be interpreted and this will be converted into internal representation of 734 in a location which will have to be prescribed after the format string as variables. Except if you just put variable names, since this is a function, the actual parameter will never go back to the, sorry, the formal parameter will never go back to the actual parameter. So when you call, the original value will be transferred inside but it will not get back here. So to do that, you use pointers here. That is why scanf will always use pointers along with the function. So here are some examples. Scanf, percent %d, blank, percent %d, and m and n. I am reading two values, m and n. I will give some values. It does not specify the field width. This permits me to input large value or small value. But it does say, there is a blank in between these two. That means the two values will not be concatenated together. After that, there will be a blank. So whatever the values they come, they go into M and N because you are passing pointers. Here is another one to get floating point values X and Y and a string. So name is a care array of 40, percent F, percent F, percent S. So what a string you type. Here is another example of scan F something which you cannot do using C in at all. Suppose I had typed a very compact record of bytes. I knew, for example, that in an inventory control system in my manufacturing plant, I use a six-digit number to identify an item code. I know, for example, that all item names are shortened to six characters. And I know that subsequently I will have a floating point number which will give me value of one of those items. So I maintain my inventory thousands of records like this. How do I read this inside? I can read it using scanf by saying, interpret the first six characters as an integer number and assign that value to A. Interpret the next seven characters as a string of seven characters and assign it to item code, which is an array, no pointers interpret the last set of characters, whatever they come, till you set a blank of course, you interpret that as a floating point number, assign it to x. In short then, scanf and printf provide a much greater control for you to prepare a neat looking output and to capture any kind of input. There are other string functions such as strcmp, this function can compare two strings. Why would you like to compare strings? You remember sorting, you sort in ascending order of numbers, descending order of numbers. What if I have given you names and I said sort on ascending order of names? 
if you recall your lab batch are formed in by taking the entire group of 90 students or whatever and sorting them in ascending order of names as they have been published on the ASC website. How do we sort? How will you sort? So you will take the names as arrays. Now you have to compare this element with this element. So you want to compare two strings. The two strings may be equal or one may be smaller than the other depending upon the lexicographic or dictionary order. Name starting with A is smaller than name starting with B and so on. Such comparisons are possible. You can do that yourself because you know that ASCII code for A is smaller than ASCII code for B. But you will have to do too much work to compare two strings by writing a program yourself. There is a function called STRCM. You can read about it, what it returns when both strings are same, what it returns when first string is smaller, what it returns when first string is larger. But you can make that comparison. The other thing which we will not discuss in details is a string copy statement. You are given a string, you have an array in which you want to copy the characters from this string here. You can always set up an iteration from 0 to length of that string minus 1 and copy one character at a time. Instead of that, somebody has already written it, string copy can give you this. There is an str ncpy or string copy is so many characters. In which case it will carry only those, uh, copy only those n number of characters and automatically put a backslash 0 at the end. Okay. Since these are valid string functions, they deal with null terminated strings and they produce null terminated strings. Sprintf is an important function which we shall be using in some examples on the file handling. What does Sprintf do? Sprintf does exactly what printf does, except printf will produce the output string on your terminal. Sprintf instead will say, I have constructed this output string, but I will put it in a string that you tell me. So you can actually take a numerical value integer variable, floating point, string, another floating point, etc., etc., compose an ASCII output as if it will look on a terminal. But instead of going it, giving it out to you, you say, I put it in a string called S, say 1000 or S80 or whatever. Why would I do that? I might want to compose a strings which will eventually go into a large file. So instead of putting f print f, instead of putting print f, which will necessarily put everything onto that file, output file, I can put it in string. There are a variety of ways where you can use this s print f. We shall be using it in one particular example. Here is an example of a sprinter. Suppose I have a character array 75 elements. Obviously, it can contain a character string of 74 characters only. Backslash 0 has to be there. Let's imagine that I have a roll number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And I have a batch number which is 1, 1, 2. Notice that it looks like nice characters here, but internally this is a 4 byte internal binary number. This is also a 4 byte internal binary number. Both are int. Ordinarily, I would have said printf and I would have got these values to look like this outside. But I can say percent %5d, percent %3d, backslash n, roll, comma, batch, and then say sprintf. The only additional parameter here is the name of a string, which did not exist in printf. All that it means is, with this control string and the variables, do exactly what you would have done to produce an output, except Instead of producing that string on the output, put it in S. Obviously, S has to be large enough to contain the resultant string. Otherwise, that string will be truncated or padded with blanks, etc. In fact, it won't be padded with blanks. You will have a backslash zero character after this output is done. You can exa examine and experiment what exactly a sprintf does and so on. But what this particular thing will do is, it will produce a string 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, blank 112 backslash n. Why blank? This blank will come because you have a blank here. It may not be visible. If you put five blanks here, five blanks will come in. Okay. Sorry? Backslash n is a new line character. The new line character is made part of the string because I said so. So actually, if you write this onto a text file, then it will become an ordinary text file which you can edit using GLA. 
because every line ends with a back, backslash. A string does not terminate either by space or enter. A string inside C++ is terminated by backslash 0. And that backslash 0, I will have to insert in an appropriate array element. Up to that is a valid string, a backslash 0, the string is over. What you are talking about is when I give input on keyboard, please remember it all depends upon who is reading that input. If CIN is reading that input, then a blank will terminate a value or enter will terminate a value. If scanf is reading that input, then depending upon the format specified. And there is no way other than that of reading input, that's all. So don't confuse between blank or this terminating input and something terminating a string. String is a data structure, it's an array. Each element contains a character. It will have a series of characters whenever a backslash zero comes, as far as C++ is concerned, that string is over. What it contains, it doesn't matter. No. Yeah. <laughs> that that when you when you print this string, this itself will go to new line. You don't have to give a new line separately. After that, it will come to the next line. So next printing will occur at the next point. It is not necessary that you include the backslash n, by the way. You can remove it. If you remove it from here, it will not go. I just illustrated it to show that any character can be put in that string. I am tempted to ask the same question which I asked for a long time ago to someone here. Why the hell would you like to do that? A backslash 0 is known to be a string terminator. Okay. If you insist on putting backslash 0 as a part of your string, if anything else is written after that, it would be never recognized in S by any function which processes S because the first backslash 0 will be treated as having terminated that string. But technically to be sure, if you insert a backslash 0 yourself as a part of such an operation and then say my operation is over, C++ will loyally put an additional backslash 0 there. That second backslash 0 in its entire lifetime will not be looked at by anybody because the first backslash zero will terminate you. And for God's sake, never put backslash zeros in strings, not a healthy practice. Right. Now we consider the notion of a file. You are all familiar with files. Files have names. Where do files stay? Files stay on this. Generally, you have files called p1.cpp, right? So this is one file. There could be another file in data.txt. I have shown some boxes here, but that box contains a large number of bytes. Now, the way these files are handled by the operating system is different than the way these files are handled by your program. As far as the operating system is concerned, it has a component called file system manager which manages these files. That is how you get directories, subdirectories. That is how you get to have names for the files and extensions for the files. Each file has certain properties which in Unix, for example, you can find out by saying ls minus al, some name. So you will know who can read, who can write into that file, what is the size of that file. A file has a path from root, all of that you know. Now all that happens in the physical world. In the programming world, you deal with a file in a logical sense. As far as the program is concerned, a file is defined in terms of a file pointer. So logically, C++ treats a file as a large array of bytes. Such a large array that ordinarily it cannot fit in the memory. You know, computers have large memory, 2 gigabytes, 4 gigabytes, but still larger days, 300 gigabytes. So suppose you had a file which contained the census data of the entire country. 
100 crore people, 120 crore people, and for every person, let's say name, address, this, that, that, some 200 bytes of information. How much 200 bytes into 120 crores. A lot of information. And if you think you can easily build a computer, you have a lot of money, you will buy a larger computer, consider the following. We are now storing not 100 bytes or 200 bytes per person, but 10 fingerprints of each person. So you will never be able to handle this entire data in, in, in this, in memory. But you still have to process that data. So how do you do that? So therefore you use this notion of files. In general, the files are broken into records and within each record there are fields. The most common example is for every student I enter marks. Roll number, name marks, roll number, name marks, roll number, name marks. So I have as many records as there are students. In each record there are three fields. This is a good example of a text file which you can create for input data. But I would like something more from such files. When I want to search for a student to find out how many marks that student got, I don't want to keep reading every record of the file till I reach that person. I would like a mechanism to directly access that student's record. Is it possible? We shall see after the mid-same, yes, it is possible. For the time being, we just look at the basics of the file, where C++ says that as far as I am concerned, the file is represented by a pointer called a file pointer, which typically is a pointer to this entire structure. Let's say FP. Every file will have a pointer associated with it. Inside my C program, I should be able to open this file. I should be able to read or write into this file. And at the end, I should be able to close this file. Now, this is a hypothetical file. In actual practice, I will like to do reading and writing with the disk file. So, there has to be some method of associating my logical file with the disk file. And if I want to deal with 20 files on the disk simultaneously in my program, I should be permitted to define 20 such pointers associated one with one file, another with another file, etc., etc. All that is in fact feasible. So this is how the file is handled. It is handled through a pointer. Please don't mistake this to be a pointer to a value. There is a value internally, but it is considered a file pointer. It has a special type called capital F, capital I, capital L, capital E. So that is called a file point. I will define a logical file in my program by saying file FP. If I want more than one file, say I want to handle one input file from which I want to read data and I want to create an output file on which I want to write data, then I can say file star in file comma star out. These are all pointers. These are called file pointers. So in short, internally, as far as C++ is concerned, every file is attached to some file pointer. As many files as you want to open and process, those many file pointers should have been defined. And those many file pointers should have been associated with the corresponding physical files before you start doing any read-write operation. So naturally, this association, as I said, happens when you open a file. Therefore, in order to process anything in a file, you must first open it. Once you open, then you can read records from that file if it is opened for input operation. You can open a file for output operation, in which case you can't read records from there, but you can write to it. So obviously, there have to be some special functions which will write to file, read from file, open a file, close a file. Once such functions are there, sometimes there may be error while writing a file, suppose disk is full, or you open a file, you say associate this file with in data.txt. But when C++ during execution goes to your directory, there is no such file. Now it will come back saying, I can't open this file, but how does it tell you? So the function which will open the file will have to return a value. Usually these values returned are pointers. And usually if something goes wrong, these functions return a null pointer. Null pointer means, sorry, I could not do whatever you asked me to do. We shall see some examples of this. First, we consider text files. 
assume that you have used gedit and created a file which contains some five digit numbers followed by a name the name could be a variable character string but a single string and a third number which you can recognize as equivalent to a batch number so consider the first is roll number second is name third is batch number i have artificially created this text file such that these three fields are separated by commas in between exactly one comma no blank and artificially i have put a additional comma at the end you will not naturally get such values why i am doing this because the problem that i wish us to solve is to take each string get it from the file internally dissect this string into three different parts and recognize first part as roll number second part as name third part as batch number this is actually string processing but i do it by reading these things from a file what is our interest is to see how files are opened and handled incidentally we will see how these strings are processed to capture different elements so the problem is to read records from the text file extract the three strings from each record in three separate arrays then construct a single string you actually got a single string from input but that string contain commas the way i want you to construct a single string is that first five characters is the roll number next 29 characters is the name so if a name is smaller actually you have to pad it with blanks the string should be exactly 29 and the last three characters should be batch number you are getting ascii characters from input string so you have to just keep them as it is there is no binary to ascii ascii to binary conversion required but we shall see later that that can be done. so this is a problem let's see how this problem is solved this is the sample line so how what is the logic that i will use any suggestions i have to construct ultimately out of this i have to construct a string which will have 10108 followed by n i l m a n i blank 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 how many till i become 29 and finally 111 no comma should come somewhere so suppose before constructing this string i want to make three different strings one i call let's say roll the other i call name and the third i call batch can i not say that i will start with some index k which begins looking at this k will be zero every time i see a non blank character i will put it to the first string increment k take the next character put it in this string keep doing that till i hit comma the moment i come across comma because the rigid specifications i know that roll number has ended and name has started so if i am making an index i to maintain roll number i equal to 0 then 1 2 3 4 etc i should actually hit this comma when i hit 5 here then i will terminate roll i will insert a backslash zero there in here and reset i to zero and start looking at this this name is a bit tricky because name may be smaller than 29 characters so whenever i encounter a comma after the name that is likely to be less than 29 characters so remaining positions from that point to 29 characters in this string i will fill up with blanks and i will do the same thing with the third so this is the logic there is a program which does this we are mostly interested in how the file is handled because all this data is now coming from a file no c in no scan here is a program which defines the line string at so this will be used to actually read the complete string that is typed as in the file so whenever i read a record this is like a record which is one string then i define the student roll number s roll student name as s name and student batch as s batch 6 30 and 4 these exact sizes i define some index variables look at the way the files are defined and used file star fp that means i intend to use a file fp is equal to f open input data dot txt comma r 
these two are important parameters the first parameter is the name of the file as is known to the operating system so using gedit if i have created that file and i have called it input data dot txt then that's the name i have to give i can give some other name if i want to open different files by the same program i can put a character string variable here and first read the name of the file and open that file by giving the character string so these variations are possible r stands for read file so i'm going to read so this opening means that please make available to me records from here instead of r if i write w it means it is an output file so i'll create an output file as i said this f open my bomb if it can't open this file because it was not there or because you did not have permissions to access it then this fp will be null no valid pointer will be returned and that is why you check if fp is equal to null could not open file return minus 1 the program terminates you can't do anything about it on the other hand if you come here that means you have got the file open now that you have got the file open you read one record at a time and for each record do this entire stuff of separating out three parts so let's see how very quickly how that is done f get us line string 79 comma fp you would be familiar with the function get s we have used it to get a string f get s gets a string from a file it has an additional parameter which defines the number of characters that you would read if the string that is given on the input is less than 79 because remember how get s is terminated by putting a new line character a new line character cannot be read by get s only get c can read it if you want you can also use get c with files the corresponding function is f get c so whatever you can do get s and get c you can do f get c and f get s using files anyway this will read you a string into the array line str now you got an array line str which contains that string this is another thing while not f e o f in bracket fp what is f e o f e o f means end of file f means files end of file if the file has ended for example suppose you have in data dot txt and there is nothing inside the first time you try to read get s operating system will say i have i have not found anything what the operating system does is it will raise this flag file has ended the end of file flag is an important flag in file processing when it becomes true that means operating system says nothing there if that flag is false that is fallen down that means there is material to be available so that is why you test for not f e o f f the flag is not set which means it is false you can test it against true or false while the flag is not set that means i have i have got some valid characters when i did my f get that is how i come inside the loop very obviously i am now having a valid string through get s i will process that string do whatever partial movement i want to do and i will come back to this while loop before coming back i will read another string now when that string is read and i come back i will process the second string but while reading some string like that in the iteration operating system will say no more string at that time the flag would be raised but i would not know it till i come back to the while loop and the while condition says not f e o f sorry f e o f now flag is raised get out so that is how i'll get out what am i doing inside we will not spend time in discussion you can look at it all that i am doing is i am running a while loop without any body i am saying while s roll i plus plus equal to line string k plus plus what this will do is it will take the kth element of line string and assign it to ith element of s roll and whatever is the value of this that will be checked against a comma and of course when i finish this entire thing k will be incremented by 1 i will be incremented so i will put 
line string 0 to S roll 0, line string 1 to S roll 1, line string 10, 2 to S roll 2. Suppose line string 6 or 5 is actually comma. I will put line string 5 into S roll 5. So, S roll 5 will become comma and then I will increase to 6 or 7. When that happens, I will have come out. When I come out, I have gone past that comma. The comma itself should not have been there. Instead of comma, I should put a backslash 0 to terminate that string. That is why I am assigning i minus 1 to backslash 0. And of course, I reset i because I am starting to assemble a new string s name. K continues endless. You will notice why I have put the last comma after the third thing because then everything becomes identical. First part, second part, third part. In the second part, there is a small squiggle. I may notice a comma depending upon how big is that name. The name is 5 characters, 10 characters, I will get out very quickly. Then the remaining positions from I minus 1 up to 28, I will pad with blanks. So this is the blank assignment. And finally, I will put a backslash. So I got these three strings here. What do I do now? I output this N plus plus, S roll, S name, S batch. N plus plus is a running counter. Initially N was 0. So, I will get 0 string this, first string this, second string this, third string this, etc., etc. After outputting this string, I get another string from the file. Remember, first string I read outside, the second string I read at the end of this while loop. Logically, I should get another entry. When I get it, I will go back to the while loop and continue. If that flag, end of flag has not, end of file flag has not been raised, that second string will get. Some time or the other after 10, 15, 20 strings, the file will say no f getters. So, this f getters will actually be executed but will not get a valid string back. But at that point of time, operating system will raise that flag somewhere else. That flag is being observed by us in the while loop. I will come out. And when I come out, I will say input file has been read and printed. Okay. So, this is a simple way. We have understood a couple of things here, how to open a file, associate an actual file, how to read strings from that file and how to test for end of file. These are the important concepts here. Rest of it is string processing. Here is another program which we will quickly look at which actually reads from a file and writes to another file. So, it has an input file which is a text file and it has another output file which is also a text file. So, obviously, I deal with two different strings. I create a line string AT uh, array to read an input string. Then I will break it up into three parts, compose my largest string and I will put it in out string. How will I put it in out string? I can put these three separate strings in out string by using S printf. And then write this entire string just like I said F get S, I can say F put S. It will put that string onto the output file. We shall see that example. I have defined two files here, 5 star fp, 5 star fp out. Ordinarily, the convention is I will say fp in, fp out. If I have multiple input files, I could say fp in 1, fp in 2. In general, when I do data processing, for example, a master data processing in our uh, application software cell, where your data is processed, the files would be named as student master file, subject master file, teacher master file and they will contain data for all these people. And of course, in modern days, you do not do data processing using files that we did in, in the older days. Now, you use mechanisms called database management system. We shall have a glimpse of what a database is subsequent to the midsem. But here, we have these two files. I open this input file. This is very standard process with R as the mode for reading. If fp is null, I will say could not open file, I return minus 1. I do exactly the same thing with output file. I have given it an arbitrary name, student db dot text. db stands for database. So, student database dot text is the name of the file I am giving. By the way, this is exactly like when you say save my file in gedit, where you type a name. So, when I say open this file with this name, actually I am going to the operating system saying in my directory create a file by this name. 
and open it for me because I am going to write to it. W says write. Here I could know why I will not be able to open a file for input if the file did not exist. Why I should not be able to open a file for output? Why will I get null? Space is not there in the disk. A file already exists. For the first part, your answer is true. If there is no disk space, I cannot open an operating system, cannot open a file. Another way why it, you may not be able to open the file is that the directory in which you are running this program, you may have only read-only access. You may not have permission to write in that directory. Then operating system will not permit you to open. But the second point that you mentioned is incorrect. Even if a file by that name exists, the F open with W is so strong that it will delete this file and create a new file. No, that, that is why the file permissions are there. Yes, that is why. Right. So the file permissions will govern. In general, however, when you are doing file processing in a directory, you would have taken care of these permissions and the space. So ordinarily, we expect that you will not hit across these problems of file uh, uh, permissions. Anyway, now this program is no different than what we have seen already. So we'll not go through this. I get a line string while not end of file, I process this string. I am doing exactly what I did earlier. But what is interesting is what I do now. I am now preparing an output string and I am writing it to database. So the sprintf is what I am using. sprintf will do what? It will behave like a printf. So this is the format string. Percent %2D, percent %5S, percent %30S, percent %3S. What am I writing? I am writing a serial number in two digit form. I am writing roll number in five characters place. I am writing S name. This S roll is not integer. They are all characters. But you will see that if I had integer or floating point variables, I could easily convert them into a single string like this, a ASCII string. And then all this uh, string which has been made will be put into out str. Now I use F put S out str FP out. I just write out. Having written that, I read the next input character string and keep on doing this again. So it's a pretty simple thing. Read data from input, write data to output. Yes, he's asking F close FP, F close FP out. Uh, it is like, what if I don't behave decently with my friends? They will be angry with me. But since they are friends, they will not shout at me. That's exactly what C++ does. It becomes angry at you. But then knowing you, it closes the files itself and then says, OK, next program, please. Okay. However, there could be problems. The errors could be such in your program that when you quit, there could be a lot of orphan file handles remaining. In a, in a major performance problem in one large insurance company, we found that Thousands of thousands of temporary files were being created, but not were getting deleted. And then the disk was getting filled up, not by contents of the file, but just by the entries for those many crores of files. So funny things can happen. It is better to own up the responsibility for the mess that you are creating. So if you open a file, you close a file, period. When you execute this program, finally you will just get this. Notice this is so different from ordinary execution of the program. When you execute a program, you type input, you get output. Here there is no input, no output. It just says input file read, output file. So in order to figure out whether the output was generated correctly or not, what you should do? You should say cat studentdb.txt or less studentdb.txt or gedit studentdb.txt. Somehow you have to see this is how the file will look like. Notice that. I have inserted so many blanks to make this string 29. This is how the file will look. OK. OK. Why am I showing you this? This is a spreadsheet. Most of you would have seen a spreadsheet. We use spreadsheets, for example, to enter your roll numbers and marks and batch numbers and other things. This is how our data has been put in here. Why am I showing you this? Ordinarily, when you are dealing with large data, you will be creating data very often on such spreadsheets. 
Now this spreadsheet data is stored internally in a completely different format. But if you want to process it with C++ programs, you will have to convert this data by saving it in some kind of a text format. The most common way of saving this data in text format is called comma separated values format or dot CSV format. This is a text file. Every spreadsheet is capable of permitting you to save the data in text format. For the sample data which is shown in the previous slide, this is how you will get. So, roll number, name, comma, batch number, marks. Roll number, name, batch numbers, marks. There are only two differences between this and the previous data. What are the two differences? First, after the last field, which is incidentally a floating point value now, because it's fractional, there is no comma at the end. There is a new line character. Second, the name itself could consist of multiple portions, first name, middle name, last name, whatever. That means when you process this string, you will have to do some exercise in actually processing, separating out these parts, etc. Again, text file processing is largely to do with string processing problem. The file handling portion is very straightforward in at least the simplistic terms that we have seen. We will see more complex things later. So, some of you may want to try to see if such is the data that is given, whether it is given in a file or whether it is given as an input. You can use redirection. You should be able to handle this and make, for example, find out what are the average marks of the whole class, what are the average marks per batch, etc. Et That's all.